on behalf of chairperson Uma Chigru Party and her committee, I, Honorary Secretary Radhika Agarwal, extend a warm welcome to our esteemed guests, Dr. Rachis Ella, Dr. Pragnya Chigru Party, respected past chairs, and my flow friends. Locked up at our homes, listening to headlines and watching the mortality rates is what the entire world is experiencing today. It's been more than a year since we discovered the deadly virus that brought the world to its knees. The one thing we know for sure is that the pandemic is real and it's here to stay. We are in one of the most testing times, but hope is one thing that will get us through this. We are in this together and we will come out of this together. To do so, we have to follow some strict guidelines, stay home, double mask, sanitize, maintain distance, and most importantly, get vaccinated. Anything that promises relief is welcome. And hence, the demand for vaccines is soaring. We all want to know what the vaccines mean, how effective they are, and the side effects and controversies. Today, we have with us Dr. Rishis Ella from Bharat Biotech and Dr. Pragnya Chigrupati, who will tell us everything we need to know about getting vaccinated. Let us start this evening by salutation to our national flag. Now, I would like to invite Chairperson Uma Chigurupati to give her welcome address. A very good evening, everybody. Welcome to today's session, Dr. Reja Sella and Dr. Prajna Chigurupati. Uh, before going ahead with our session, I regret to announce that Flow family lost its founder president, Srimati Indu Jain, who is the chairperson of Times Group. She died because of COVID-related complications. Uh, it is a big loss for the flow fraternity. Hyderabad chapter two lost one of its members, Mrs. Nafisa Ismail, because of the same reason. On behalf of flow Hyderabad chapter, we offer our heartfelt condolences uh, to the grieving families. A quick recap of the month of May from Flow Hyderabad. As I have mentioned earlier, we from Flow Hyderabad chapter formed a COVID care cell in the beginning of this month and our members working relentlessly to reach out to those affected by the pandemic. With the primary goal to promote women entrepreneurs in our members by way of incubation, Flow has col collaborated with organizations like we have IIIT, MIT, and IIT. I'm happy to announce that our first cohort with VHub is coming to an end, and the members will soon be graduating. On the occasion of Mother's Day, we hosted a virtual health talk by noted gynecologist, Dr. Shashikala Kola. She discussed many issues pertaining to the current situation and how to take care of ourselves and then the health of the family. The COVID-19 pandemic became a global health crisis. It has changed the economic, medical, and public health infrastructure. Around the globe, and India in particular, healthcare professionals and researchers from biotechnology and pharma industries are looking for an effective treatment regime. Our country is the worst hit in Asia and surpassed Brazil also. Since there is no effective medical treatment has been found to work with high efficacy, getting people vaccinated is the only long-term solution to the current situation. In this context, we have to mention only about two vaccines from our country. As a nation, we should be very proud of India's self-made vaccine against COVID, that is Covaxin, developed by Bharat Biotech International Limited. 
they have the expertise of developing many vaccines earlier but developing in the current situations under pressure and against timelines is not a simple task this is indigenously developed and manufactured in our country and has the credentials of all kinds of international and scientific organizations let us hear about the journey of the making of covaxin and clear the questions we have about vaccines in general from dr rajesella dr prajna chigurpati will maneuver the conversation in a way to clear most of our doubts and dilemmas besides these keep all your questions handy towards the end of the talk dr rajesella is a medical doctorate in india completed master of science in clinical research from emory university and a post doctoral fellow from john hopkins university where he was trained in vaccine clinical development he is the project leader for all sars cov2 vaccine and is involved in the making of zika chikungunya typhoid rotavirus and japanese encephalitis he is the head of business development and advocacy at bharat biotech he has multiple papers published to his name in reputed science journals the talk today will be steered by enga generation dr prajna chigurpati is a breast oncoplastic surgeon and a consultant in hyderabad she has done a fellowship in breast oncology in tata memorial hospital mumbai she did her mrcs and breast reconstruction training in uk she will be moderating today's session the floor is all yours rachas and prajna go ahead thank you for having me mr chagrapati <laughs> hi hi everyone and thank you for having me here um it's pretty interesting to be doing this on uh, today's platform because one obviously vaccines are the hot topic and secondly it's and I, I think it's really, really nice to be doing this with Rachis as we went to college together. So, um, well, hopefully, at the end of the session, all your questions regarding vaccines will um, have answers to them. First of all, um, I would like to congratulate Team Bharat Biotech as well as Rachis for uh, coming up with the first indigenous vaccine of India. And uh, like it was mentioned earlier, it's extremely proud. It's an extremely proud moment for uh, you know us as a nation. and hopefully the future holds better for us so riches to begin with um the big word for today is obviously vaccines and it is the hot topic of debate so going back to 2020 around february when this all started in india it obviously started much before that in china and other parts of the world suddenly all eyes were on you and um there was a lot of media speculation some good some bad but through it all there was a dignified silence and your work finally spoke and having had conversations with you i also heard um you know the logistical issues that you had even while transferring viral samples from pune because of the lockdowns and curfew which was a major challenge for you and you had to send your team by road to pick up the viral sample so when you and your uh, team heard about this what exactly went on in your mind what was the when was the inception of covaxin um what challenges did you have to face uh behind the science as well as logistics especially with the curfews lockdowns and everything was haywire at that point of time so do you want to give us a brief journey <clears throat> sure absolutely pragya so uh, with, the, with when the pandemic hit in january when this virus was detected in wuhan and the genetic sequence was um, put out on the public domain uh, we started working quite uh, in a rapid fashion uh we 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 were able to license two technologies from university of wisconsin and the thomas jefferson university these are two academic universities based in the states for two different kinds of covid vaccines one was an intranasal and one was an injectable vaccine and then when the pandemic started to creep its way back into india and when prime minister modi announced a janta curfew which was sunday that was the first and only day of a lockdown for us from monday onwards it was back to work back at the factory we don't have a corporate office so life every day revolved at our genome valley campus which is in shamirpet hyderabad 
I've mentioned to you before we started working on these two vaccine candidates with American academic uh, academia. However, due to the lockdown, international lockdowns, it was extremely hard to ship things from the US to the to India. So then our chairman, Dr. Krishna Alla, had a idea to work on another kind of vaccine. So a third kind of vaccine candidate, um, which is called an inactivated vaccine. So this is um, been around for several decades. It's a conventionally safe vaccine. Um, the only concern one would have is how, how good of an immune response does it generate? How efficacious will it be? But from regards to a safety standpoint, inactivated vaccines are always considered to be safe. So Dr. Ella, our chairman, had initial discussions with the director general at ICMR, Dr. Balram Bhargav. You probably see him um, on these uh, news conferences every day, along with Dr. Paul and other dignitaries from the Ministry of Health. He had a conversation with Dr. Bhargav to import the strain. So this is when I say strain, I'm talking about the actual COVID-19 virus. So this virus was actually um, detected and stored in a lab in Pune called the National Institute of Virology, which is again government run. So thereby we had an agreement with the ICMR, the Indian Council of Medical Research and this lab called NIV Pune. We had a tripartite agreement where we could get that virus shipped over from Pune to Hyderabad. And when I say shipped over, this is actually, um, Sunday was Janta curfew, Monday two of my daring colleagues in the midst of a national pandemic, sorry, in the midst of a national lockdown, drove down to Pune, picked up the virus in their car and brought it back. That's how daring this attempt was. There were no fancy logistics companies or DHLs or FedEx to do this work for us. We had to do it ourselves. And I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I applaud my colleagues who made that effort to go to Pune and pick it up. And as soon as we got the virus to Hyderabad, then everything was more or less clockwork. As Ms. Umar Chagrupati rightfully mentioned, we have an array of vaccines at Bharat Bhattu. We manufacture 16 different kinds of vaccines. Many of them are based on this inactivated vaccine platform, approximately five are. And you've probably taken some of these inactivated vaccines, probably to your children, you would have given them an injectable polio vaccine, or you probably take an annual influenza vaccine for the elderly people at your house. So, this inactivated vaccine was not new to us. Once we got the virus, it was more or less, um, we kind of knew the methodology, what facilities we could deploy for towards this and what kind of raw materials we needed. So in that way, we were very much streamlined. We were able to organize our raw materials also, which is a hot topic these days, and also the supply of glass vials as well, which we were able to foresee that there could be a shortage of glass vials because there's many manufacturers making vaccines. So there's a whole list of materials that one needs to foresee before starting a project like this. And please note, this is all this is all assuming that this vaccine is going to work. Um, for those of you who are not part of the vaccine field, um, that the probability of success that a vaccine will come into the market from the stage of discovery to the stage of it being licensed and available in a hospital near you, the probability of success is 6%. That's why there are so few vaccine manufacturers. You need to be, your risk appetite needs to be extraordinarily high and the developmental process is extraordinarily long. So we were able to foresee many of these risks, um, mostly in part of good collaboration with the ICMR and also our expertise. You know, it's, it, the more you explain, the more I'm convinced that it only takes an experienced um, company like Bharat Bio to foresee all these circumstances and go ahead with what you did. Uh, my question is that, you know, you said you had 6% success rate, right? So what kept you motivated throughout? Oh, it was quite simple. I mean, the frontline healthcare workers were battling it out in the hospitals. Um, luckily, I have a white collar job. I sit in front of a laptop and conduct meetings in conference rooms. But my colleagues in manufacturing, in fact, we have 2000 colleagues uh, 2,000 employees in this Hyderabad facility, 70% of them are manufacturing. So that is our entire workforce. Um, so they are the ones actually in the lab and they are the ones growing the virus. Um, when you make an inactivated vaccine, essentially what you do is you have these large, uh, we call them bioreactors. They're like fermentation tanks. If you've probably gone to 
um, um, a, a microbrewery which manufactures beer, you would have seen these large steel tanks. So it's something like that, but in a highly contained biosafety level three manufacturing facility where my employees are completely decked with protective uh, equipment. They have oxygen cylinders behind them so that they don't breathe the ambient air. They breathe the air coming out of the purifier. So those are the colleagues of mine who are actually the most daring. And um, we inspired confidence from them and the frontline workers. And of course, it was a matter of national importance. And um, after studying for so long and working so hard in this field, this is, our, this is our true calling. So we were happy and fortunate to be a part of this journey. It's not only the frontline workers that should be applauded today. It's people like, you know, the guys in your manufacturing units that actually have to be as well. Um, so, Rachis, you mentioned that um, yours was an inactivated vaccine, right? So, in simple terms, could you explain what exactly vaccines are and what is the actual process behind making them and bringing them out into the market? And this is pertaining to Covaxin as such because you have come up with an inactivated vaccine and the data shows good results. So, from the beginning till the production of one vial, how long does it take and what are the phases that you have to go through? This question is because I, I think most of, uh, most of us uh, who are not in the vaccine field often tend to ask, you know, we have doubts regarding why it takes such a long time to produce a, the, the vaccine. So could you just explain that to everyone, please? Sure, definitely. So I'll start with the first part of your question on vaccine 101. <clears throat> so vaccine basically is a biological product that is either injected into you or it could be intranasally administered or administered through your skin. And this product, once it enters your human body, it, it kind of stimulates or it, it tells your immune system what to do. It gives it a message what to do. And your immune system reacts to this um, vaccine, which is injected into your body, and it starts generating an antibody response to that. So thereby the antibody response that is developed towards that vaccine essentially should help you towards preventing you succumbing to the disease. That is essentially what a vaccine does. It's a highly regulated biological product. These are usually given to prevent, not cure. So once you get the disease, you can't take a vaccine. But in anticipation of you getting the disease, you can take a vaccine. Vaccines are highly regulated because of this reason, because it's a prophylactic because you're giving it to healthy individuals. You're not giving it to individuals who are sick or who are terminally ill. This is, it's not like a last resort option. So, and vaccines are primarily, as you are all are aware of, they're primarily given to children, children that are not able to fight off diseases at such a young age because their immune system has not been fully developed. So that's ex essentially what a vaccine does. It enters your body, it stimulates an immune response, and your body then will be able to fight any pathogen or any virus that any virus or bacteria that enters in the future. Coming to the development of the vaccine, so it all starts off with R and D. R and D is critical. Um, there are no generics with vaccines. One has to start from the very scratch, and one has to build their intellectual property right from step one. It cannot. You cannot take it from someone else and put it into your factory and replicate it. So that's why it's very time consuming. One has to do their own R&D, their own developmental process. And then when you identify a molecule or your vaccine candidate that you have confidence in, this entire process, this discovery process takes anywhere between two to five years. And that's assuming if you're successful. And once you're successful, you need to do a laborious preclinical toxicology study where you give it, you inject mice, rabbits, small animals, where you see if the vaccine is creating that immune response, because small animals are fairly consistent to human beings as well. So you're able to gauge the safety of the vaccine once the vaccine is administered into these animals. Are their organs okay? Is it causing any abnormal reaction in their organs? Um, is it creating a good immune response, which is desirable for a vaccine? And once it passes that test, it moves to I'm sure you've all heard of this phase one, phase two, phase three, human clinical trials. And again, because you're giving unknown new substances into the human for the first time, you need to be extremely careful. So phase one is always done in approximately 50 or so human beings. 
And then if, if it proves to be successful, you, you primarily look at the safety of the vaccine. If that's successful, you move to a larger phase two in probably 300 people. And if that's successful, you move to a phase three, um, where you move to possibly anywhere above 5,000 or 10,000. So this entire process of human clinical development takes anywhere between seven to 10 years. But it was restricted to less than one year for you guys, right? Exactly. That's something I never learned in textbooks. Uh, so I'm really fortunate to be here in Hyderabad, working with Bharat Biotech, learning how to make a vaccine in 11 months, which was never heard of. Um, of course, uh, kudos to my colleagues and employees, but also there was a tremendous amount of collaboration with our collaborators, the ICMR. They helped us a significant amount of the way. They helped us for doing all those pivotal animal studies. Um, and also the Drug Controller General of India, they are, our, they are like the Indian FDA. Uh, they were also quite um, speedy with their review process and their validation process. And they were giving us speedy approvals as and when we requested for. So Rachel, you mentioned that um, vaccines as such are supposed to be given to healthy people, right? So today, if I am infected with COVID, uh, the COVID virus, am I eligible to take the vaccine after, uh, after I'm completely cured? So absolutely. I believe the current <clears throat> Ministry of Health guidelines state that um, if you are infected with COVID-19, after your symptoms resolved, you can wait for a certain amount of period uh, to take your COVID-19 vaccine. I believe the current guidance by the Ministry of Health is six months. And the only reason for that is because there are studies looking at people who got COVID naturally, and they tracked their antibodies for a, for over a time span. And they noticed that even after six months, there was a antibody, there was detectable antibodies in the blood. So it's for those reasons alone, such guidance has been given. And with this approach, I think it's a quite wise approach. With this approach, you're able to, knowing that in the second wave, so many of our citizens have been infected, it will at least allow the citizens who have not been infected or who are naive to COVID get their opportunity to get vaccinated. Right. So I will get to that question of antibodies because there are a lot of queries regarding that. But before that, um, about your phase three trials, the three phases of your trials, um, at the moment you have completed phase three and you are writing up the paper, but how hard was the rec uh, recruitment through the yeah, so it was. It's quite hard to do any clinical trial when you're when you're dealing with human lives, um, especially with a novel product, and during India's biggest healthcare crisis, and also when you're doing India's largest thirty thousand sample size clinical trial, and when you ask these hum participants, we call them participants or volunteers in our terminology. So these are people who participate in the trial. When they, when they come to us and if they show interest, we have to do something called, a, we have to take their consent. So we have to explain the entire risks and benefits of participating in this trial. And also in the phase three trial, half of them received the vaccine, half of them received a placebo, which is just a water injection into your arm. So that placebo gives you no benefit from COVID-19. And you have to tell the participant this. When you get into this trial, if you want to volunteer for this trial, you either get vaccine or you either get placebo. So you either may be protected or you either may not be protected. And we don't know who gets vaccine, who gets placebo. It's called blinding. So the doctors at the clinical trial sites, 25 hospitals we partnered with, did not know. The patients didn't know. And we, the sponsor, also did not know. So that's quite a challenge to explain to volunteers that you get a 50% chance of receiving this vaccine. That deters a lot of people from joining clinical trials. But what we also saw was people saying, hey, even if I have a 50% chance of getting something that might be even marginally effective, why not? It's a good, it's, it's some amount of protection, it's better than nothing. So that was the kind of mindset um, our trial volunteers had. They were extremely optimistic and positive about it. And we were able to completely enroll or um, recruit these 25,800 participants within a month and a half's time. So the turnout and the enthusiasm shown by the doctors part helping us with the trial, the investigators, and also the trial volunteers is extraordinary high.
That's fantastic. So now that I actually had you here, I had one question regarding your phase three trial. Uh, the, the journal is yet to be, I mean, the paper is yet to be published in the journal. What are the results? Yeah, so um, so usually with medical journals, if you disclose the results before giving it to them, uh, they tend to hate you for life. <laughs> so unfortunately, I can't share that information with you. Um, it will be out in a peer-reviewed journal. If it's anything you need to know about Bharat Biotech, we've been extremely transparent with our vaccine development, with Covaxin. We have nine peer-reviewed publications on Covaxin. I encourage you all to read them and some you might think these are extremely scientific and medical oriented but when you write a paper it's supposed to be comprehensible to even a 10th class person who understands english so i encourage you to read them um, our phase three paper will be our 10th peer-reviewed publication and which hopefully will solidify claims that covaxin is safe efficacious um, and that will come out soon Pragya. just give us some time but however, we um, our second interim analysis. So that's where, when you're going through the trial, you're going through your phase three trial. You you keep taking pauses and you keep looking at the data as to saying what are the preliminary results. So we got a we got a hint of that at our second interim analysis, which states that the efficacy of the vaccine is 78% uh, towards mild, moderate, or severe COVID-19. Okay. Great, that, that's amazing. So my next question is regarding the spacing of vaccines. Um, well, I read a three month follow up in the phase one study uh, about when we're supposed to be taking the booster shot, right? That's the second shot. And um, there was a lot of debate and there's an existing confusion between different vaccines. It's not only Covaxin, but even Covishield and the others based on the spacing. Um, in your phase one study, it says um, you, you tested for between 14 days and in phase two, it was 28 days. And the current guidelines say that the most recent guidelines say that Covaxin, the, the, the space between the first and the second dose is 28 days. And for Covishield, they have recently pushed it to around 12 to 16 weeks. So um, well, scientifically speaking, what exactly determines this time period? And now that if the, um, because of the increased spacing, does the efficacy actually change? Sure, absolutely. So the only thing that determines public health policy is evidence or data that you generate from clinical trials. So that's what we're doing. That's what Covishield is doing as well. Uh, with regards to Covaxin, yes, you're right. The window to take it is 28 days, the dosing interval. I, uh, that can also be extended for above two weeks as well. So from the fourth week to the sixth week, you're eligible to take your second dose. However, in fact, if you're not able to get your second dose between that fourth week to sixth week interval, still continue to try to get your second dose at any given point of time. You need not repeat the whole thing again. So just get your first dose and just make sure you get your second dose regardless of the dosing interval. I don't think one should be bothered too much about that. It's very important to get your second dose. With regards to Covishield, um, I can, from what my understanding is of the literature that's out there on the AstraZeneca product, they have done clinical trials that suggest that their vaccine is equally efficacious if you widen that dose interval. So if you take the first dose and then if you wait for three months and take the second dose, you're, it, nothing happens to your efficacy. They are saying, however, that your immune response is slightly better. So that is the rationale. From a from a programmatic standpoint and from this pandemic standpoint, the reason why the government of India, I can't speak on their behalf, but my understanding tells me that the reason why they made this decision is to ensure that there's a lot of first dose availability for other people who've not received the vaccine. So it opens it up to more people that are vaccinated. And there is a certain amount of protection conferred from both of these vaccines, even after one dose. Right. So um, just to reiterate, Covaxin should be taken within 28 days or whenever you get the second dose, but there's not, no, no reason to panic. As in when you get the vaccine, you should be able to get administered. So once you take the vaccine, reaches, how long do the antibodies last? Do we have data on that? Yeah. So, I mean, every month, for every month in Bharat Biotech, there's always a new question to answer. This is the question we're trying to answer right now. Unfortunately, it's going to take a little more time. 
um, we are because we've started from phase one, two, three. We have approximately twenty-seven thousand people that are under a clinical trial as we speak, either phase one, phase two, phase three, and we're closely monitoring them. So we do have data suggests that three months after your second dose, there's a good amount of antibodies. We are analyzing six months time point right now, and we'll publish those results soon. And we have reason to believe that they should be good as well. Um, you will have a good amount of antibody responses after two doses of Covaxin after six months. Now the real question lies is when do you take a booster? Um, I'm I'm not talking from a commercial standpoint. Of course, if you say from a vaccine manufacturing standpoint, it's great to say take three doses because that's more income to the company. But in all essence, the only reason why public health policymakers are suggesting that you might need to take a booster is because of these variants of concern. Because the variants are leading to diminished performance of these vaccines, it's important that you take a booster so that you can be protected not only against the original COVID, which was first detected in China, but also the emerging variants, which are being detected all across the world. So um, I can't give you an answer as to when you should take your booster because we don't have data. Once we have data in a couple of months, we should have that data. And if our drug controller general approves, they will make the final decision, whether a two dose or a, a booster dose is required. Um, and when they make that decision, it will be made publicly available. Okay, so we are yet to wait the answer for that. Um, so when you take the vaccines, now, nowadays everyone is, once they get the shot, they go and start getting their antibodies measured. Right, and uh, it's kind of surprising to actually see people getting these tests done and they plan their exposure based on the number of antibodies that they have. I keep getting a couple of calls asking me if, um, just saying that I have 13 antibodies, am I safe? I have no antibodies in my system. Well, ultimately, would you like to comment on if it's actually necessary to check the number of antibodies and if they're depleting and panic regarding that? Because obviously, once you take the vaccine, they do work. Absolutely. So I would say there's two important parameters for evaluating the performance of a vaccine with regards to an immune response standpoint. There is, there's two things. There's antibodies and there's T cells. So T cells are a part of your immune system. It's probably only 2% of your immune system. But those are the cells that actually help you out in the long run. Those are the cells that actually remember that you got COVID um, and it remembers the next time it sees COVID-19, it's going to rapidly produce antibodies. That's what the T cell does. And your normal antibodies, which are called B cells. So you have B, B stands for Bangalore, T stands for Trivandrum. So your B antibodies are your short-term antibodies. So when you get natural COVID or when you get the vaccine, you're going to have these B antibodies for maybe six months, maybe a year, uh, maybe even more. But the T cells last you for life. They're called memory T cells. So it's very important to um, gauge the performance of a vaccine based on both of these guys, the B cells and the T cells. So what, and when you get vaccinated or when you get infected with COVID, I'm sure the first thing you're going to do is collect your blood, send it to a diagnostic center, check your antibodies over there. The problem with those tests are, twofold. Um, first of all, the assay is, is of course robust, but it's not going to tell you if those antibodies are capable of fighting COVID-19. I mean, fighting when I say fighting COVID-19, we call it neutralization in scientific terminology, but that basically means that when the virus enters you, do those antibodies have the potential to thwart or to kill the virus? So the test you get from your diagnostic lab is not the best marker of telling you whether you're protected or not. Secondly, the tests that you take at these centers are possibly um, uh, antibodies that look at other surface proteins of the virus. So as you might know, the spike protein is uh, a very important part of the COVID-19 virus. And most of these viruses um, target the spike protein. So if you generate an antibody to the spike, you should be able to prevent from getting COVID-19 because the spike antibodies have the best um, capability of fighting off the virus. So these diagnostic centers, 
at times, most of the times, I've been I've been getting this as well. I get a lot of WhatsApps with, please look at my antibody score. Um, and it's not always a straight answer, but these antibody tests, majority of the times report two kinds of antibodies. Antibodies to the spike, which are the important ones. Antibody to the nucleocapsid, which we still don't know how important it is. So my suggestion is, and also these diagnostic tests don't tell you about the T cells the trivandrum cells, which I was talking about, which helps you for the long run. So I think it's very important to, of course, you can track your antibodies, speak to your doctor about it, but I don't think that would warrant you to get, warrant you to pursue getting a third dose or so. I think the amount of antibodies that any vaccine generates is at an adequate level, otherwise it won't be licensed, is at an adequate level to protect you, at least for the short term, at least for six months, is the data that we have today. So the bottom line is that don't keep getting your antibodies checked regularly and just trust the vaccine that you've taken. And you're Absolutely, trust the vaccine, but the buck doesn't stop there. Vaccines, as you know, I just told you, Covaxin's efficacy is 78%. But there is a, there is a trick to make that 100%. And that's COVID-19 appropriate behavior. So if you can do a combination of these things, go get vaccinated and continue to be mindful of your surroundings and your behavior. I think you 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 should have no reason to get COVID nineteen. Right. So you have answered the my next question as well, but I'm just going to ask you the question again for the sake of the viewers today. Um, the uh, people have there have been instances where people have taken the first shot and then they get infected, and the next question is, I just took the first shot. Why am I infected? So do you want to comment on that? Yeah. So few reasons again. Um, the first dose is partially effective. It's not, you take the first dose and you're done. No, you still have to take the second dose. And your immune system takes time to develop a response. The second it goes into your body, it doesn't mean you're just snapping your finger and antibodies are produced. This is a biological process. The immune system doesn't know what's just been injected into your body. It takes time to understand it. It's like preparing for an exam and getting 78% marks. You need to study for a little bit, right? So that's what your body does. It takes time. It, in this case, for Covaxin, it takes about 45 days. Um, assuming you get the first dose and the second dose on time, by the 45th day or the 56th day, we have reason to believe that you should have a good antibody response. So it takes time to get there. So after you take the first dose as well, please be mindful. Please implement all COVID-19 appropriate behavior. So the bottom line is that even after you take the second dose of the vaccine also, you might be infected, but the severity of it will be a lot lesser. Absolutely. That, that's what we're seeing these days, especially with these variants. I mean, we did not predict that there would be these variants. But of course, um, virology teaches us that viruses mutate. That's their only goal. Their goal is to survive, uh, no matter how, hook or crook. So they do mutate. They do mutate to gain entry into a, another human being. That's how viruses evolve, and that's how they've been around for so many years. Um, with these variants, the performance of the vaccines are slightly decreasing, but they're not decreasing to a drastic rate where you should be really concerned, but they are decreasing. So one should be mindful still that once you're vaccinated, continue with these COVID-19 appropriate behavior. COVID protocol is absolutely necessary. You just can't walk around saying I've been vaccinated. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of clinical questions now, uh, Rachel. Um, can pregnant women and breastfeeding women take the vaccine? So I've been, I've been told that the Ministry of Health are having discussions like this. Um, from a co-vaccine standpoint, uh, because it's based on an inactivated vaccine platform, these vaccines are usually um, allowed to be given to pregnant mothers. We, in fact... Uh, give influenza vaccines, which are also inactivated to pregnant individuals. However, right now, both the vaccines in India are not uh, indicated for pregnant and lactating mothers. I, I, I've been hearing, I'm not sure, I've been hearing a rumor that potentially this will open up for at least lactating individuals. And after some more data is collected from both these vaccines, it will be opened up towards pregnant individuals. From a Bharat Biotech standpoint, we do know that pregnant mothers, lactating individuals, and children are special populations that we need to address as well. Our work doesn't stop here. I've mentioned that we've completed our phase three trial. 
but there's something called a phase four trial as well. I don't want to get, I don't want to bring too many numbers with you today. But once this vaccine is licensed, this is when we start looking at children, pregnant mothers, and lactating mothers as well. So this is the next step for us to do these kinds of clinical trials in such cohorts to understand the safety and immune response of the vaccine. But we're quite optimistic that this vaccine will be safe, will be efficacious in these individuals as well. We just need some more time. Right. So you said that the special population are the pregnant lactating mothers. Uh, what about children under the age of 18? You have started studies on that as well. And where do we stand today? So we've just received our permission to start a pediatric trial in children as young as two years of age up till 18 years of age. That trial will start any on June 1st. Um, the first week of June is when we plan to initiate the trial. With pediatric trials, one needs to be extremely careful. They're not adults. So you need to be a little more um, cautious with your approach, with your execution, and make sure everything runs smoothly. Um, the last thing you want is harming a child. Uh, and we have tremendous amount of experience doing clinical trials in pediatric populations. In fact, that is our bread and butter. Uh, adults are much harder. Um, but that trial will start June 1st. Um, and assuming things go according to plan, assuming that the vaccine is safe and it's able to generate an immune response in these children, we should receive approval from the Drug Controller of General, General Sue. I'm sure there are a lot of parents out there waiting for the vaccine to come out for their children, especially with the second wave. There are lots of children being affected at this point in time. Um, my next question, Rachel, is, is can women on their menstrual cycle take the vaccine and can couples trying to conceive take the vaccine? Sure. So I think the first, um, the first question you asked was quite intriguing to me. In fact, I found out about this rumor about a week ago, and it was quite surprising. I was like, wow, this is the new one. Um, so the short answer is, yes, you can take it. Uh, please don't take it. Um, please don't subscribe to WhatsApp University. Um, less time from your phone is much better. Trust, um, I've, I've been trying to do that, cut down on phone time. So please take it even if you're, um, if you're, if you're experiencing your period. Coming to your second question, partners who are trying to conceive yes, you can still take the vaccine. That's not an issue at all. But if you're planning to conceive in the immediate future, possibly like a month or so, then perhaps it's better if you wait for the Ministry of Health guidelines on COVID-19 vaccinations for pregnant mothers. Right. Um, Reaches to a layman, they, they read a lot of disclaimers on the vials and media, and like you said, WhatsApp University, saying, consult your doctor before you take the vaccine. And there's so many conjectures regarding the side effects. I'm going to split my question into two. Are there any contraindications to taking the vaccine today? Yeah, so the contraindications right now are quite rare. I mean, the, like a contraindication would be like, we are not currently licensed to give co-vaccine to a HIV infected individual or an immunocompromised individual. So these decisions Bharat Biotech cannot make. These are decisions that the, the primary health care, the doctor has to make. So Pragna, if you have a patient and they come to you and say, and if you have an immunocompromised patient post-surgery or whatever, it is the doctor who has to make that call in the best judgment of the patient. Um, what we know is that the vaccine is safe. We've done extensive trials in 30,000 people. We've rolled out the vaccine to approximately 20 million people in India. So we're gathering all of that data. But again, when you come to these special populations of HIV infected people or immunocompromised people or uh, people who are on chemotherapy, it gets very nuanced. And it's very difficult for us to do these many clinical trials in such a short interval to give you our recommendation. But this is where I think the ultimate authority should be the doctor. So ultimately, though, uh, for example, cancer patients and those with ischemic heart disease or any, any such comorbidities will have to speak to their doctors before taking the um, well vaccine. The other question is, um, we know that if every vaccine comes with side effects. They can be minimal and they can be to a certain extent, but it's ultimately an inactivated vaccine that's entering your body. 
and uh, there's so much data, there's so much media hype about these side effects and people are well at least a couple of months ago they were extremely nervous to take the vaccine what are your comments on the side effects and why people should not be afraid to take a vaccine sure so that's a fantastic question um even if hypothetical scenario if i take the purest form of water put it in a syringe and inject it into someone's muscle there will still be a side effect that is how the body reacts to anything that it thinks is foreign anything that's foreign your body reacts it's a natural phenomenon in fact it's good if your body is reacting to it because that's how your body should be that's how your immune system should function that's how that's what causes a process called inflammation your body is on red alert and it's ready to detect and fight whatever that foreign substance is so as mentioned to you in the first part of my talk that's exactly what a vaccine does it is a completely foreign entity it um it it does not belong it is not part of your body once injected your body detects it and then it starts going into work mode starts to detect the virus starts to mount an antibody response and when all of these good things are happening when your body is actually functioning doing what it's supposed to be doing there are other kinds of reactions that occurs when your body is operating at such a level it could be fever it could be a rash it could be swelling at the site of injection it could be generalized weakness if all of these are mild or at least self limiting um and that and if all of these occur at such a low rate like 1 in 10 or 1 in 20 it's acceptable for a vaccine to be injected into you. that's usually what we do we study this extensively in i told you 30000 uh, people have been vaccinated in our clinical trials this is the essence every trial is always looking at safety you can't you can't ignore safety so this is what we do this is what every vaccine manufacturer does so as long as the the risks which are your side effects are extremely low and the benefits are extremely high which is the benefits here are protection from you either getting mild covid disease or severe covid disease or even um succumbing to the infection so it's always a risk benefit analysis and that balance always has to be tilted towards the benefit and if it's always the case a vaccine gets licensed the phase 1 data did show good safety results as well right um and it also does not mean that um if you do not have any of these side effects it does not mean that the vaccine is not working because that was a commonly asked question as well so any uh, precautions after taking the vaccine reaches with regard regards to your daily activities like you know uh, exercise or diet and some people smoke uh, consume alcohol any precautions before yes. i know- absolutely so i think it's quite important for you to be in a healthy state before and after you take the vaccine as i mentioned to you before you're going to get injected with something foreign you want your body to be operating at a good level um i've i've read papers that exercise does help your immune response so i'm not i'm not i can't really explain what is the causal link between good exercise and a good immune response but i do know it decreases stress so I try to exercise to whatever extent you can not go hardcore just a mild moderate exercise is what i suggest before and possibly after good sleep sleep is quite important you don't want to be stressed out when you're getting a vaccine and also probably refrain from alcohol or tobacco consumption for maybe two days before and two days after just to make sure you know you're operating at a good level and you feel all right you feel healthy and you go in for your jab and i would like to add good hydration as well at this point in time absolutely so, uh my next question which is is what is herd immunity yeah so herd immunity is um a topic that's you know also been circulating around you know i studied this in my epidemiology textbooks and i'm i was quite surprised in the beginning of pandemic everyone seems to be talking about it um herd immunity is um for example you, you take a room of 10 people and um you know uh, say pragna and reaches are vaccinated um and when we go into that room of 10 people because we're vaccinated we potentially don't have the virus 
So in thereby, you're giving some indirect protection to those other 10 people around you. So that's what herd immunity does. But herd immunity is only effective when you have a certain amount of people vaccinated. You need to have a minimum of between 60 to 70%. There's no real hardcore number on that. But you need to have a good amount of the population vaccinated to be herd immune. And I'll tell you why herd immunity is important. You know, there's going to be cases where you can't give vaccines to certain individuals. Pragya can probably elaborate on this much better. Severely immunocompromised people or people who are really terminally ill. You can probably range more examples, Pragya. But there are indications where you can't give it. You can't give it to maybe if Covaxin is licensed in two to 18-year-olds, it's not going to be licensed from newborn to two-year-olds. So that in, those individuals, those babies, infants, can't be vaccinated. Severely ill, terminally ill patients cannot get vaccinated. So at least if you're vaccinated, you probably won't be, there's a good probability that you won't have the virus in you, that you're protected. And thereby, if you interact with such, such and such individuals, you won't transmit the virus to them. So it's indirect protection given towards people who are not vaccinated. That's what herd immunity is. At this point in time, how long do you think it would take for us to achieve herd immunity via vaccination? So that's a tough call. I mean, you could, you, could, you could get herd immunity from either natural infection or vaccines. But what we've been seeing is that um, natural infection is probably not the best approach to use. Uh, you can't just say, oh, the second wave has you know, um, gone through India, so maybe we don't need to get vaccinated. No, I think it needs to still revolve around vaccinations and vaccinations will still continue to be the key for us, at least for the next year. Right. Um, so the other common question that comes to me is, Rich, is that, for example, um, patient, this per healthy person, XY, has taken Covaxin, like the first dose of Covaxin around two months ago, and they've gotten their sh the second shot after 28 days. But obviously, with the current wave and the changing variants, uh, if they have access to any other kind of vaccines, can they take it? What are combination vaccines? And can we mix these vaccines? So right now in India, we don't have any data to indicate to the public that it's okay changing up vaccines. Uh, I would not advise it right now because we don't have data. Science is completely evidence-based research. Um, they are doing similar studies like this in the UK where they're giving you a Pfizer vaccine and then they're giving you a AstraZeneca vaccine with the second dose or they're mixing it up. They're giving you first the AstraZeneca vaccine followed by the Pfizer vaccine. That data is extremely preliminary right now. We're hearing that it's still causing some amount of side effects. We don't know how well the immune response is, but for the time being, my recommendation is not to mix and match. This is not a buffet, uh, strictly a set menu. Just take the vaccine that you get and make sure you're immune, you're strong immunity-wise. Um, so Rachel, also intranasal vaccines, you're coming up with that and studies are going on um, at the moment. Comments on that? Very preliminary again. Uh, I don't want to make comments uh, of a project that is ongoing here at Bharat. Um, however, our belief is that um, an intranasal vaccine, so the advantages with an intranasal vaccine is that, of course, it's like a spray that goes into your nose and it, it stays in your upper respiratory tract. And what that does essentially is that it tells your immune system here in your nose to generate an antibody response. And these antibodies are called Ig local antibodies. So they reside only in your nose. And the, 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 the scientific understanding behind this is that if you have antibodies in your nose, when the virus enters, it's going to get killed immediately. So it's not going to get a chance to go downstairs, which is to your lungs, and cause pneumonia-like symptoms or uh, cause respiratory complications. So if you can kill the virus here, prevent it from going downstairs, you, you've solved the problem. You, you will probably prevent disease. You will probably prevent infection. And if you prevent infection, if you stop it here, you'll prevent transmission as well. So you, that, that's the golden triad of a vaccine. That's the holy grail. If you're able to stop disease, infection, and transmission, you've hit the jackpot. That's what we're trying to do. Um, we have good, strong animal data, which were done by the Washington University in US that suggest 
that we're on the right track. However, human data also needs to corroborate that. And that's still ongoing. Right. So just to underline, I've, I heard this interview by Dr. Krishna a couple of weeks ago, where he clearly explained that the vaccines that we have today only protect you from lung down. And the intranasal vaccines are the ones that will protect you whenever they do come out. So obviously it is extremely, we shouldn't be under the misconception that we will be protected and we should not be taking, we should not be wearing the mask and following the regular COVID protocol. So am I right in saying that? We should, vaccines do not protect you completely. You're absolutely right. Vaccines don't protect you completely, but it's important to get um, a majority of the population vaccinated in this country. And I believe that's what we're all working towards. But no vaccine is 100% efficacious. So the best way to combine that is with your continued mask and social distancing and other COVID-19 appropriate behavior. Right. So I have one last question before Mrs. Umachi Gurupati will take over for the business related questions. Um, how does it feel to be in a global platform with such huge amount of responsibility and media scrutiny? Constantly. Yeah, it feels great. The media scrutiny, not so much, but um, uh, the kind of service we're able to do for our country and for the world um, is quite remarkable. Our chairman always says that he doesn't look at Indian, Pakistan, or Afghan, or any other country. Uh, he looks at all citizens as global citizens. So vaccines should be available to the people of India and the rest of the world as well. Um, that's what we do with pediatric vaccines. We supply around 700 million doses of only pediatric vaccines every year. Uh, so in that way, we're extremely fortunate that um, all the risks um, are now paying its dividends. Um, we're fortunate to have developed this vaccine in collaboration with a public organization. So we always talk about public-private partnerships. They rarely turn out to be eventful, but this collaboration was a joy to be in. Uh, fortunate that the vaccine is working, is safe, is efficacious. Um, also fortunate to possibly educate the country in the right way. I mean, with every form of communication coming from our organization, we've always backed it up with the science behind it and with our papers that are that speak um, that speak more than our words. Fantastic. So before I say a uh, sign off, uh, Rachis, um, well, congratulations again and kudos to Team Bharat Biotech. And I really hope um, everything goes well and if we are like protected in the future. So good luck with that. And um, Mrs. Uma Chikurupati will take over the next couple of questions. Thanks, Pragya. Thank you so much. Uh, Rages, I'm just going to ask one question. No signs. What is the distribution system of vaccines like? If an organization like Flow for its members are from industry to vaccinate its employees, how do we go about it? Can you just let us know? We need sure. that. Sure, absolutely, uh, Mr. Krupati. So right now, we are allowed to sell to three entities technically. We're allowed to sell to the central government, which is the Ministry of Health in Delhi. And we're also allowed, and the second entity is the state government. Individual state governments can procure co-vaccine. And the third are private hospitals who have a co-in registration, who are a registered um, vaccine delivery center, and who have the medical capabilities to handle any untoward events. Um, we cannot directly supply to any corporate or private entity. That's the clear mandate given to us by the government of India. That being said, I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs and private entities here. Um, my recommendation to you all would be to start your discussions with a private hospital and then ask the private hospital to come to, to Bharat Biotech. Right now, in terms of our supplies, if I, for example, if I'm making 100 doses today, 70 of those doses go to the central government where above 45 year old participants are getting vaccinated. Um, sorry, 70 of them are going. Another 20 are going to the state governments and I'm only left with 10 doses to give to the private hospitals across the country. So this is the allocation ratio of what has been, this is the mandate given to us by the government and this is what we're following. So of course, supplies are extremely strained and the timelines are slightly delayed but our goal 
our objective here at Bharat is to get this vaccine, to make sure this vaccine is equitable. When I say that, I mean that it's accessible to all parts of India. Thank you, Rachis. There are so many questions. Many people, uh, I think, uh, they would like to ask their questions. Uh, Radhika, would you like to take it over? Yes, Uma. Thank you for the wonderful insights. That was extremely enlightening session. So well moderated, Dr. Pragnya, and so well addressed by Dr. Rachel Seller. Let's use this information and help generate awareness among our friends and family as well. Our chat box is filled with lots of questions. Now, I'd like to invite our members to come forward with their questions. Our first member is past chairperson, Rekha Lahoti. Uh, hello, Pragna. Hello, Rachis. It was such a nice conversation hearing the young generation, uh, you know, talking in conversation. My question is, Covaxin is not uh, approved by WHO for Indian travelers traveling international, whereas, uh, you know, AstraZeneca, Moderna, uh, Pfizer has been approved. So what do you have to say on that, Rachis? Sure. So we've, we started this process with the WHO. It's a it's not in an immediate approval that you get. It, it takes a couple of months. So we've started that process and we're quite hopeful by Q3 or Q4, we will receive our WHO approval. Uh, Bharat Biotech in the past has been approved by the WHO for several other vaccines. So we're not new to this process. We are aware of it. Um, however, our main interest right now, all of our resources are diverted towards ramping up production. You've probably read in the media that we're expanding facilities into Bengaluru and Gujarat. So that's where our, um, most of our time is going. But however, this is still, this process with the WHO has begun and it will be available soon. Thank you so much. You guys are doing a commendable job. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member, Sarita Rao, has a question. Hello, this is Sarita Rao. And... First and foremost, let me thank Uma for this organ organizing such a wonderful session. My query is about the vaccination among the children. Uh, I know this is still under trials, but I want to know by what time of frame these trials will be completed and ready to be administered on children. And I'm curious to know how the process of vaccination in children will be done. It will be like in elders in two jabs, or will it be like nasal drops? Sure, so with children right now, um, nasal drops is quite far um, ahead, of, uh, ahead in our timelines because we're yet to establish if it's working in humans adequately well. But for Covaxin, which is an already licensed vaccine, we've started our pediatric trial. Uh, June first week is when we plan to start this trial. Um, it's a fairly, um, simple trial. It's not as laborious as our phase three trial. And we plan that if things go well, if this vaccine meets the safety standards and the immunological stand for, standards set forward by the, the drug controller of general, this could be licensed late Q3 of this year. Okay. Thank you so much. And definitely it will be a success. Good luck. Thank you. Now I invite past chairperson Charani Mani to ask her question. Uh, Dr. H.S., good evening. Um, yeah, this is the continuity of the um, earlier question. Uh, we are hearing that the third wave is uh, more likely to affect children. So what is your comment on that? Sure, absolutely. I believe that comment was made by a very distinguished professor in Bangalore, Professor Ravi. Um, and it, it, there is a certain amount of belief that I kind of agree with him. Um, because of the first wave and the second wave, it, it could seem like potentially more than half the population in this country have been exposed to COVID-19. So everyone will more or less have a reasonable amount of antibodies towards COVID. And when the virus can't affect those individuals, individuals who've been previously infected, they'll try to go somewhere else. As mentioned to you before, that is what a virus does, it tries to survive. So this is the hypothesis that it might go to children because children are less affected. I know in the second wave, there were some, there was a certain amount of proportion being infected, but there's still from that two-year age gap to 18-year age gap, 
there's still a lot of children that um are susceptible to getting covid-19 so uh, i kind of agree with him that's my personal opinion um with regards to the vaccine um, our duty is to try to get this vaccine license as soon as possible for our children when can we expect what's the timeline sure so the late q3 is the timeline assuming things go according to plan when i say the vaccine is safe the vaccine is able to generate an immune response late q3 of this year I have one more question, Dr. Rachel. Uh, will this COVID-19 vaccine required every year? Th- that's a good question. So there is reason to believe that that could be the case. Um, it could be a booster maybe once a year, depending on the variant that is circulating. So these variants are have been detected, and it's not the end of them. That we're going to see more and more variants. So um, these boosters could be based on the variants, very similar to the flu vaccine you take. Thank you. Thank you so much. Preeti Jashnani from Fort Kenai would like to ask the next question. Thank you so much for this wonderful, insightful session. And my question to you is: My daughter is going to be turning eighteen in about six months. So she's currently seventeen and a half, two thousand three born. So can she go ahead with the co-vaccine? I'm sure, she can go ahead. Definitely, once she turns eighteen. Um, and i'm assuming sorry you said chennai correct yes so i'm i'm not too sure if the chennai government has sorry the tamil nadu government has allowed 18 to 45 year olds but if that's the case she is more than welcome okay thank you i invite past chair person kamini shraf to ask a question uh my question is uh, what is the procedure for the clinical trials uh, what we hear about uh, we could you throw more light on it a lot of our members would like to know about it sure so the clinical trials that went into any vaccine or covax any vaccine any vaccine and especially the covax sure so i'll give you an example of covax like especially so- the trials are going on for the transnasal vaccines and the vaccine for children so is is there any procedure to it and whom can the if anybody is interested whom can they contact oh absolutely so for the pediatric trial um there uh, there are um there is a hospital in hyderabad um perhaps i could it's not yet finalized right now but once finalized i'll share it with mr grupati and she could probably disseminate that information to you all um of course um the, the the only requirement is that the the child should be either a uh, covid-19 negative through rt pcr swab a nasopharyngeal swab and also that the child should not have covid-19 antibodies in their blood um so the child should be negative for both of these tests the reason i say that is that it's very important to have children who are not exposed so that any immune response coming out in this clinical trial we know that the vaccine is causing this immune response and not a past infection so i'll i'll be happy to share those uh, data with uh, those uh, contact details with uh, ms chigrupati and she'll be she'll disseminate that to you all i invite our member arshi absa to ask the next question uh- So, Dr. H S Ella and Dr. Pragnya Chigurupati, uh, it's fantastic to see the millennials play such a vital role in the present medical and health ecosystem. So, kudos to both of you. Uh, my question to you, Dr. H S Ella, is: uh, We all talk about uh, who should take the vaccine, why, when, efficacy. Can you tell us who should not take the vaccine and why? For example, I've heard someone say someone who has a history of severe or immediate allergic reactions to injectable medicines shouldn't take the vaccine. People with a known COVID-19 exposure should wait until their quarantine is over before being vaccinated. So, your expert take on this, please. Yeah. So, um, I think first and foremost, it's important to speak to your physician, um, be it your family physician or your internal medicine physician or. whichever physician is closest to you i think they should be the ultimate authority it should not be coming from vaccine manufacturers um coming to who should take it who should not take it um, pragya and i discussed that there are some extremely rare circumstances where you can't give it to individuals such severely immunocompromised or um really young children i'll actually probably i'll defer that question i'll defer that response to pragya um and i'll take the um the latter part of your question with regards to the ingredients or the injectables so 
it's very important that when you're before you're taking the vaccine, please read the fact sheet that comes along with it. It contains the ingredients of that vaccine. And if you have a known allergic response to any of those ingredients, please do not take the vaccine. There are about three or four ingredients in the co-vaccine. Co please read it carefully before you take the vaccine or please consult with your physician. Pragya, I think you should weigh in here. Um, I agree with Rachel's on this comment. Um, again, those some women and some, some people are extremely allergic to the components of the vaccine. And uh, the vaccine will have the ingredients of, you know, whatever is, whatever they're made out of. So, um, especially those uh, people who have allergic reactions, severe allergic reactions, I think it's very important that they consult their doctor before taking the vaccine. And besides this, also the severely immunocompromised and uh, those with extreme comorbidities, uncontrolled, the young uh, children on different kinds of treatments, all of them, I think every single person should be individualized before just administering the vaccine to anybody. Um, and that's, that's a call that your doctor will have to make at the end of the day based on where you stand at that moment in time. Uma Gandhi has a question for Dr. Pragnya Chigrupati now. Good evening. Good evening, doctor. Hi. I think uh, Dr. Riches has already uh, given the answer. But now I would like to ask Dr. Riches that the government has opened a vaccination for 18, uh, above 18, but still the vaccine, we are not getting any vaccines. So what is your take? Like, when will it be open in the market? We are all waiting for the vaccinations. I want to get my staff and everybody vaccinated as soon as possible. Sure, Miss um, Gandhi. So my uh, understanding right now, uh, I'm assuming you're from Telangana or Hyderabad. Um, my understanding is that 18 to 45 is still not allowed in Telangana. They are prioritizing the above 45 year old age group. Um, however, there are other states which have opened it up to 18 to 18 and beyond. So um, if you could just be a little more patient, hopefully our uh, state government in Telangana will relax it and it should be available to you. Thank you. Thank you. We are hoping for the best. <laughs> Thank you. Now I invite Sangeeta Verma for her question. Uh, good evening. Am I audible? Yes. Dr. Rachis, uh, this is a question to you. Uh, I, first of all, uh, congratulate you and your company and you at a very young age, are, uh, you have abundance of knowledge about uh, vaccines and you're doing a wonderful job. So my question, uh, production and deliverance of any vaccination uh, requires infrastructural support like uh, cold chain supply and uh, of course, government policy. What are the challenges you face as one of the premier manufacturers of vaccine uh, in India, especially with our with the great uh, tussle between um, you know different states and uh, the policies changing uh, uh, in different states and the uh, tussle between the union and the state governments. Of course, the second part you can choose not to answer if you don't want to. Sure, absolutely. Um, every day in India is a tussle in its own way. Um, but we're quite fortunate. I mean, at the end of the day, um, when, when you come back from home, it's a, it's a blessed feeling we're in that this vaccine is actually working and saving lives. That's what we're all here for. Um, regardless of which government is talking to you, which state government or which central government or the politics that comes in, I think uh, one needs to uh, dwell on it less and potentially just look on the upside. That's the second part of your question. The first part of your question, that's a very challenging process. Understanding the nuances of manufacturing, having the technical know-how to execute, having the facilities. You need to have really large facilities. Bharat Biotech has plans to ramp up to 700 million doses by the end of this year per annum. So having those facilities, these are vaccines that have never been scaled up. So we are doing, we are, we are chartering a new territories here. However, um, we take confidence in the progress we've made this last year. This last year, we were focused on, you know, getting this project, uh, Covaxin to be successful, making it, ensuring that it's safe, ensuring that it's efficacious. Now we know that, that's in the back of our head. Now we're focusing on production. It's extremely challenging from sourcing raw materials. Fortunately, most of our raw materials are in the country. So we are an indigenously manufactured vaccine and we like to be, sustainable or self-reliant as well. 
Um, but also the challenge lies up ahead. As mentioned to you, we're trying to scale up our ramp GM facilities, our manufacturing facilities. So that's an enormous challenge and we're taking it a day as it goes. So uh, is the government supporting you in this? Absolutely. They were able to support us with an advanced purchase order of approximately 1,500 crores, which was issued about a month ago. And that that gives us a risk that increases our risk appetite that, you know, allows us to take those bolder decisions and those much more daring uh, moves towards increasing our production volumes. So that has helped us significantly. And the government has been along with us for the way they've been with us. They've, I've mentioned to you, Covaxin is co-developed not only by Bharat Biotech, but by the Indian Council of Medical Research, which is a government run entity. So the government has been with us the whole time. Thank you very much. In fact, I have also taken co-vaccine, two doses. Glad to know. Thank you for the support. Thank you. <laughs> now we have a next question from Sarika Burgu. Hi, Dr. Rages. Hi, Pregnia. A student of 21 years, if he's taken two doses of co-vaccine and after seven months or eight months, he wants to travel abroad, does he need to go again to the process of taking the co-vaccine two doses? Or does he need to take another company vaccine? Or he has to be just silent and just proceed to go ahead to any other country for his education purpose? Yeah, sure. So right now, because Covaxin is not WHO approved, um, showing a Covaxin certificate and traveling will potentially not work out. I'm assuming the student is going somewhere abroad for a university. So yeah. the university will probably ask him to use a vaccine that is approved by the WHO or the European Medical Agency or the US FDA. So they have a few options. Um, potentially go to the US um, and get a vaccine there. I think I would highly recommend that approach. But is that uh, time period of eight months or nine months too short to take a second, uh, you know, mm -hmm. second course of the vaccine again, or is it okay that way? Of course, it is, it is quite short. Uh, definitely, it is short. Um, however, if this is a university requirement, a maybe you could try to have some discussions with the university that would you be able to um, provide some temporary waiver for this, um, for this student. I think that's a discussion you should have with the university. But um, if, there is no, if there is still that restriction, then I would advise that student getting another vaccine. Can he take a, you know, suppose he's traveling in the seventh month, can he take that same dosage here and travel abroad? The same dosage of another vaccine, correct? I mean, yeah, of an the COVID shield company, vaccine? Yeah. yeah, example, yeah. Yeah, but then he would need to take two doses of that. Um, um, rather, than taking, rather than taking four injections in a year, if this person is going to the United States, um, I would yes. recommend going to the US and taking the Johnson & Johnson vaccine which is a single dose vaccine. Okay, right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rachis, I'll quickly take up a few questions from the chat box. Okay, uh, this question is from Vinita Chenani. How much antibodies is required to prevent COVID? Nobody knows, that's the million dollar, that's a billion trillion dollar question. Nobody knows, we're working on it. Um, the scientific community, the international scientific community are still trying to establish that. Um, but what we've been told is that the minimum amount of neutralizing antibody that is present after you receive the vaccine should be sufficient to protect you. But please note, when I say neutralizing antibody, it is not the antibody that comes out of your diagnostic report. This is a very sophisticated test that we do here in our factory. So that is the scientific hypothesis, but it's still not established so please be patient and um, this information should be available to all of us. Okay, the next question is from Jyoti Kanuri. How effective is the vaccine in reducing transmittability? So every vaccine is somewhat effective. It's not 100% it's not effective, but um, if the, once you get, say you get vaccinated with two doses and then you come in contact with the virus in your nose, and the vaccine, the antibodies from the vaccine kill it. So thereby you are preventing giving it to someone else. So the vaccine can do this, but it can't do it. So it can't do it at a really high rate. It can maybe do it between 30 to 
I still need data to back up my claim, but this is our understanding that it can do it, but it can't do it so well. Um, that's why we're also working on this intranasal vaccine, whereby we could stop the virus at its traps. The next question is from Deepika Mundra. Where does the central government vaccine goes? So the central government vaccine goes everywhere to India. Um, it, they are basically allocating it based on the population of each and every state. So if Uttar Pradesh has 100 million people, they give 10 million. They give it in a particular ratio depending on the population of each and every state. This question is from Sri Lavanya Subramaniam. Um, if you have uh, one minute, what is double mutant airborne and how does it spread? Does it spread faster than the first one? How to protect from the double mutant? Sure. So um, COVID-19 in general, um, there is new evidence saying that it is airborne. It can transmit airborne. That can either be the double mutant or it can be the Wuhan, the original ancestral Wuhan strain. So it can be anything. It can be the UK strain, the double mutant, the Brazil strain. Um, all of this can travel airborne. There's no real, we don't have, we really don't know which one has a better tendency to spread better. Uh, from Chehna Jashani, what of a person gets affected with COVID after first dose and is asymptomatic? When should he take the second dose? So if he's asymptomatic as well, my understanding is wait for approximately three, three months, which is the Ministry of Health guidelines. Um, so three months after your negative RT-PCR and then take the second dose. So I think we've taken quite a good number of uh, questions. So thank you for addressing all our queries and clarifying our doubts. So let's make sure that we test positive for faith, keep our distance from doubt, and isolate ourselves from fear. Now, I would like to announce virtual felicitation of our esteemed guest speakers. Presentation of Bidri Momentos. IT team, video, please. So presentation of Bidri Momentos to Dr. Rachis Ella and Dr. Pragna Chigurupati by Chairperson Uma Chigurupati. Bidri Craft is one of our initiatives for the year. I would now request Senior Vice Chairperson Shubra Maheshwari to deliver her vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. This isn't a pandemic of just a virus. This is a pandemic of emotion, a pandemic of pain and suffering that has to do with lost time and lost lives. At the end, it's all going to be about the COVID-19 variants and the vaccines. And that will determine where we're going to be next year, the year after, and the years after that. Vaccine is indeed a silver lining in the dark clouds of COVID, a savior of mankind. I, Shubhra Maheshwari, on behalf of Vicky Ladies Organization, take this opportunity to thank Dr. Rachis Ella for sharing with us his insights into the benefits of vaccination. I would also like to thank our moderator for the day, Dr. Pragnia Chigurupati, for her time and for facilitating this outstanding and informative interaction. I wish to express my gratitude to our platinum sponsors, Greenco, gold sponsors, Granules India, and branding partner, RBC, for their unconditional support. I would like to put on record my sincere thanks to our IT team for a seamless performance. I thank our flow members, past chairs, and the complete team of the year 2122 for their unflinching support in making this program a success. On a closing note, let us accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. Mask up, get vaccinated, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much, Rachis. Thank you so much, Pragna. Thank you. Thank you, take care everyone. You know, fantastic. Thank you. IT team, can we have the sponsorship slides? On behalf of 
Chairperson Uma Chigrupati and her committee. I thank you all for being here. It's your support that keeps us going. We all have to keep our guards up, learn to endure and overcome the situation. Stay strong, stay home. Do things that helps us to stay positive. Wishing you all a safe and healthy weekend. Thank you and namaste. Thank you so much.